sins away. We wash my sins. And we're going to go with this. He's got the whole world. Thank you, everybody. We are so happy to be here for our last in a three-part series, Collecting Recollections. Brenda, thank you so much for coming and uplifting the audience. Shelia is going to uplift you some more. Yes, we sing. We sing for a lot of reasons, everybody. We sing for uplift, to get through some of these um, situations and experiences that we have had to go through throughout our history. We sing to convey messages. Did anybody see Harriet, the movie? Yeah, that was a wonderful movie. And she, that movie reminded me of the importance of our singing because she was conveying a message that she was leaving to convey that um, Underground Railroad. Yes. So. We're gonna do a little bit more singing today, but that's for the that's for the uh, the end of the program because I don't know if you know it, but Shelia is a singer too. Yes, yes. Our assets, um, our community's assets, Newtown's assets, are its people and the stories. That is what we have. We may not have a whole lot of fancy, big, sprawling houses. We may not have a bitly in our driveway. We might not have a big old bank account. We may not be able to travel summers in Europe, but we have our stories. And that is what we are sharing through Newtown Alive. And so I am so thrilled and thankful to the Ringling Museum for allowing us to share these stories with you. And I'm so thankful also to Fred Atkins, Shelia's husband, because he was our district commissioner in the city. That's the importance of those single member districts, if I might get that little bit of politics in here. He saw that he needed to get into our community and talk to the people about what it is that they wanted him to do as a priority. And the people said, the people told Fred Atkins, preserve our history. And he went back to the city commission. It took a little while but he found some seed money to start this project. And we started it in 2015. And I can truly say, had Fred not been in office at that time and we did not have him, I don't know if these stories would have been preserved as they are being preserved now. Because you see, Newtown's history was available only in fragments. We had a paragraph in a book, if you go to the public library and to the history section, a paragraph in a book or a photograph with a cut line or maybe a sentence, but that's it. But when we started this project that was officially called the Newtown Conservation Historic District Project, that's a mouthful, but as a marketing person, I was in higher education working in, um, in marketing I knew 
that needed to be a bouncier, bouncier phrase, like New Town Alive. <laughs> yes. Yeah, New Town Alive. So we named it New Town Alive, and I tell you, it's been transformative for me. And as we uh, move about this Sarasota community, I feel that it's transforming other lives too by the feedback that we get. And we do trolley tours, we do community talks all over, and this talk. And so we're just so grateful to be able to get out into the community and share what's important to us. And that is our faith, our family, certainly education is a cornerstone in the Newtown community. And I'll mention Overtown too, because that's where the first African American community uh, settled, and also, well, I said faith, but church is also a cornerstone. So Sheila, let's talk. You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> you have some connection on these grounds. New college, that Caples Mansion, Ringlings. Let's kick it off by talking about your connections. Well, first of all, I just want to say good morning to everyone. And I want to thank Vicki and the Ringling uh, uh, Department for inviting us to come and share our stories. Well, just south of this venue here, uh, you, New College, uh, the Caples Mansion was bequeathed to New College after the death of Mrs. Ellen Caples. Uh, my parents worked for the Caples. Uh, during the early uh, mid 40s before I was born. They would travel as they came in 1899 if you read the history of the Capels after they were married. They had a late honeymoon here in Sarasota. So they would travel back and forth uh, to winter and uh, you know go back home into New York. Well both of my parents were uh, lived in Alabama. My mother worked in this restaurant and Mrs. Caples, evidently they had been doing this for a while and uh, they stopped in the restaurant and Mrs. Caples asked my mother, uh, would you like to come to Sarasota and be my cook? Mind you, my mother is a, was a very good cook and they said yes. So they would come for six months when the Caples were here and live on the premises in the carriage house, which still stands today. And so I can recollect they were coming here like in 1947. Um, now Mr. Caples died at 1949, so they did see Mr. Caples during their time here. But they would do that several years before I was born in 1952. So they came, they stayed in the carriage house. And then when I was born in 1952, uh, my parents would bring a babysitter from Alabama to keep me while they worked in the mansion. And uh, I still have a few pictures of them uh, and one of my babysitters that used to come down and keep me while they worked. So that's my <laughs> connection. connection to the Caples Mansion. And Mrs. Caples, she named me Shelia Cassandra. <laughs> what did your mom say your name would have been had she not uh, named It would have been Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. You definitely are. Shelia. I'm a Shelia. <laughs> what do you remember about the house, you know, being in the house? In the house, I remember probably running around about two. And in the middle of the house, it what seemed to me was, it was columns in the courtyard. They had courtyards in the middle of the house. And I remember running around in the courtyard as a two-year-old wow. uh, while my mother worked 
Uh, I guess the capos were not there where I could run around in the house at the time with my babysitter uh, because we, did, like I said, we did stay in the carriage house. Tell us about your parents, um, John and Delma Hammond. John and Delma Hammond. They were some special parents to my sister and I. Um, I did have an old, we do have an older brother who was 18 years older than us, but we didn't grow up in the house together. But he would visit, uh, you know, when my mother was working, he would come down and stay uh, in Florida for a while. But my mother and my father, John and Delma Hammond, they were special people in our lives. They were uh, uh, a man who loved, his, my dad loved his children. I, I hear stories of my uh, people in Alabama say, when your daddy, when you were born, nobody could mess with you. <laughs> he, he kept an eye on me like he was my mother. Um, he used to say, nope, you can't hold my baby. And so, and then when my sister came along, it was the same way. Uh, he was a, a, a man that looked after us. He, I remember when I was dating one time, he would come around with his flashlight at <laughs> maybe 7.30 in the night because he went to bed with the chickens, that's what I said. And he said, okay, it's time to go home. Uh, so, but he looked after us until, you know, he couldn't look after us anymore. And my mother, a statuesque woman who dressed to a T, I think I, I took that from both my parents. Both my parents were very stylish. I mean, very stylish before even I was born. I remember them telling me we would have custom made clothes and back then, you know, they couldn't go in to various shops, so they had a lot of seamstress uh, that were available, but my mother had such style and class. She was just like, you know, a stallion. I, I tell you, I think I took after her <laughs> and my father, uh, but she was a great cook. Uh, she, they were both domestic workers all of their lives on this earth, um, but I look at my parents, at my parents as being, um, you know, because we, we, our family, she moved here after probably 1957, so we stayed here, but all of her family lived in Alabama. Mm -hmm. So we would travel when they uh, got a vacation to go back to Alabama and visit our relatives there. She was a, the 12th child of 13 children and I didn't know my dad's side because he was born in 1897. My mother would have been 101 if she would have been living today, born in 1918. So all of her siblings, all my uncles and aunts, they were so much older, they were you know, dying off, but we would go every summer. So she did introduce us to our cousins and family, I did. Uh, meet my grandmother. Uh, she died when we were 13, so I didn't have any other grandparents, uh, you know, in Alabama, but um, all of her siblings are deceased now. But she was the one that traveled back and forth to keep us uh, connected. connected to her mm -hmm. family. Uh, so I thought that was real great with her. We'll talk more about her. Mm -hmm. You moved, um, the Hammonds, mm -hmm. the family, uh, moved from the Capel's house into the Newtown community um, in Jack and Mary Emma Jones's yes. house. And that, that's a um, notable couple because Mary Emma Jones was a little pint-sized powerhouse. She's the one who marched her hips down to the county commission and asked those commissioners in 1954 for a colored beach. Yes, that was Mary Emma Jones, and you were living in her, one of her homes. In her duplex, right behind her little cafe, which was 27th Street at the time on Church Avenue, that's where we lived. On one side, we lived, 
And on the other side, her daughter, Mrs. McElroy, and Ed James uh, live there. And I remember in the house, we didn't have a television at first, and they had a television. So we would stand on the porch looking through their window <laughs> at the television until we got one. Probably it was probably in 19, I want to say 57, 58, we, uh, my parents purchased a television. And I remember uh, that first day that we watched television on our television. What do you remember about Mrs. Mary Emma? Well, Mrs. Mary Emma, like Vicki said, she was a short in stature, but she was powerful. When you went into her cafe, you better behave yourself because she would let you know if you were out of line. And she, she wasn't mean, but you knew she meant business. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as youngsters, running around the neighborhood, you know, they all, when in, in that back of the day, they all kept, and so you had to be respectful and, uh, you know. Right, and she would do things like open up opportunities for people to have jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, Sarasota uh, was segregated in so many, many ways, but this little lady, felt like opportunities should be open to new town residents. So she would go down to city hall or county commission or talk with influential people and say, you need to open up some jobs. Matter of factly, um, Betty J. Johnson, who we do have the North Sarasota Library named after her, Betty J. Jean Johnson. And uh, there was another lady, Mary Emma, who worked in the store too. I think she was some related to Mrs. Jones now. But she, when she went down to the city, she said, we need some people working in this library. And so they filled out applications and they worked, uh, started working for the library system. And Mrs. Betty J. Johnson, she retired from the uh, library system here. So because of people like Mrs. Mary Emma Jones speaking up, Yes. Uh, you know, it's made a difference in our community. Absolutely. Then I want to talk about um, another transition mm -hmm. into public housing. And public housing was not as we think of public housing today. You know, you think of it as, you know, deteriorating, um, ugly, um, substandard housing. But at the time that you moved, it was anything but. Public housing was, I say, was the place to be if uh, you didn't own a family, a single mem member family home. It was vibrant. Uh, you had a roof over your head. You was in a community that people looked after you. Uh, it was made for larger families who could not afford uh, uh, a, a home. Uh, like my family, our family was small. It was my sister and I and my mom and dad, but there were several people that were living around us. They had six, seven children. So even right across the street from us where we lived on 1722 Carver Court. <laughs> yes. And uh, there were people that lived there until they could afford to move to uh, homes. But it was a fun place growing up. Up. It was a safe place and it was right, uh, you know, in the middle of town, uh, well, on this end, but we had a wonderful time growing up there. Talk about the milkman and the <laughs> numbers man oh. and the, what other, the ice man. Yeah. <laughs> well, when we moved, uh, you remember we didn't have, well, we didn't have a, an electric uh, refrigerator. The ice man, that's why they had the ice house. They had an ice house on 6th Street and then they had one on 10th Street. So the ice man would put blocks of ice on his truck and come through the public housing and you bought ice and you sat it in your refrigerator and it kept things cold. Um, we also had a milkman that delivered milk to our house 
and Sheila, Sheila Sanders Jesse. said her dad was one. And, well, Brother Jesse, I mean, he, not, not Brother Jesse, but there was a, our milkmaid name, a man named was Jesse, who lived in Manatee County. And every year, he was saying, okay, I won't be coming because I'm going to the World Series. <laughs> He loved uh, baseball, and every year that was his treat to himself, going to the World Series. What about the Raleigh man? The Raleigh man. If, have you ever heard of a Raleigh man? If you have, raise your hand. Well, a Raleigh man was a traveling salesperson that came through in his station wagon, and he sold things out of his car, uh, like flavorings, vanilla, you know, all the flavorings, bed spreads. Uh, hair grease and things of the such. So Did you say bed spreads? Bed spreads. Chanel bed spreads. Which people <laughs> real Chanel Chanel bed spreads. Well everyone likes now. I do love Chanel bed spreads and I think maybe from stemming back in my childhood. <laughs> we gotta talk about those games, those childhood games. Mrs. Odessa Butler is in the audience uh, today, and she also was one of those ladies that, uh, that were around you as neighbors. Also, Adele Wiggins was in the Yes, community. they lived right on my street. Uh, Mrs. Odessa lived two doors down from me. Yeah, two doors down from me. And uh, Mrs. Adele Wiggins, she lived adjacent across the street in a larger facility all because right. she had more kids. But we were all in, now Ms. Butler is a few years older than I, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I used to watch her because, you know, she was such a, I want to say a prima donna. Now she was her mother's only daughter. So she, I'm telling you, Odessa was in, 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 in uh, you know, she walked, like a model and And you know that I know that the story <laughs> that the model her mom worked for a model and the model would come and pick her up mm -hmm. and um, teach her how to walk. Oh that's why she walked that's away. Why. Oh I see. That's why. I see. Go ahead. <laughs> you know what? And and when we were on this stage talking, I said afterwards, man, I should have had you get up on stage and, and show us how this lady showed you how to walk. We might do that before this. Wow. Is but anyway, go ahead. Well, anyway, <laughs> in, in public housing was the most fun times of my memory because children played. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we invented games as well as we bought games like Jacks, Jackson. and remember about it? Jack Stone? Oh gosh, mm -hmm. I want to play some right now. <laughs> uh, we did games like fiddle sticks, or they call pickup sticks. Have you ever? Yeah. Those games, we entertained ourselves. Our parents uh, didn't have to, you know, say this or that. And then we had some dangerous games too. Let me tell you about that. <laughs> dangerous. Just imagine a plank, maybe seven feet long, about maybe three inches thick. You stack in the middle of that board other little boards that maybe it's this yay high off the ground. Then you put that board on top. Then one person get on this side and the other one gets on that side. And then you jump down and you would sail so high in the sky. You would think you were in the Ringling Barnum and Bailey Circus. <laughs> and someone was going to catch you on your uh, shoulders. <laughs> But we did not think of getting hurt. It was just fun times, climbing trees and all yep. sorts of things. Let's, um, let's demonstrate one of those games. One that, of the games, yes. Yes. Zudio. Here we go, Zudio <laughs> is the name of the, um, the game. It's an African American street song and game. And so, shall we? You, anyone know Zudio? Okay. Okay, Sheila. Here we go. Okay, first of all, you have to get a partner. And boys and girls play this particular game because we all did it, okay? And you crisscross your hands like this. And then you have to move your hips from side to side like that. But it goes like this. Here we go, Zudio, Zudio, Zudio. Here we go, Zudio, all night long. 
Step back, Sally, Sally, Sally. Walking through the alley all night long. Now, see, when you walk through the alley, because it'd be more, uh, you know, a line. Mm -hmm. And then you were walking through the alley. Come on, let's walk. <laughs> walk through the alley, alley, alley. Walking through the alley all night long. Then you would say, I bet you five dollars you can do this uh, to the front, to, to the, the back, back, to the side, 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 to the front, to the back, to the side, side, side. <laughs> that was so much fun. I mean, we invented games, and I'm telling you, another dangerous game we did. We climbed on top of the roof, and we would jump down. What? Oh my gosh. That was so much fun. <laughs> it's, it's Thanksgiving season and we're, a lot of us are sitting here thinking about our grocery list and what we've got to get. Some of us will be cooking. Some of us will be buying our cornbread at Whole Foods. I saw an African-American woman in there ordering cornbread. I'm like, you gotta be shame of yourself, sir. <laughs> I know good well you're not in here. Whole but cornbread. <laughs> No, ma'am. <laughs> you lose your cool card. <laughs> you know, some things now, we just want to do the short version of it. Right. You know, but, you know, if it's good, buy it. <laughs> what were the smells, Sheila, uh, that you can, that you remember wafting through the house, your mom's cooking, you said? Yes. Well, let me tell you, first of all, you know, with my mom working in the Capel's kitchen, and then after she uh, stopped working there, she worked for another family that would uh, vacate in, you know, six months here and six months in uh, Spring Hill, I mean, Spring, uh, Spring Hill, uh, Illinois, Springfield. Yes, because we would go to their house too. She, what she cooked for them, she cooked for us. So, when I was growing, when we were growing up, duck. <laughs> she cooked duck, and then we had uh, lamb with mint jelly. I remember asking, Mom, why, what, why is this jelly green? She'd say, that's mint jelly. That's what you eat with lamb. <laughs> we would have stuffed cabbage rolls. We would have stuffed peppers. So my mother cooked, you know, she said, what's good for them is good for us, too. So we tried. That's why I have a lo I love to eat, as you can tell. And you and, love to cook. And I love to cook. But the smells and, oh, gosh, the cakes. Talk about those cakes. The cakes. And I didn't get the recipe that I really wanted was my mother's cherry crumb cake. She made a cherry crumb cake that made you hurt yourself. <laughs> it was so moist. It was so good that everybody in our neighborhood loved her cherry cake. Although she made great German chocolate cakes and any other cake, jelly roll cakes, any kind that you would love. But that crumb cake, matter of fact, uh, Pam Robinson, who uh, lived, and now she's a, a, a retired principal from uh, Pinellas County, she, came, she said, Sheila, do you have your mama's cherry crumb uh, recipe? I said, oh my God, you remember that cake too? I said, Pam, no. I've been looking for that recipe. My, even my sister, she was going online and I would try some of the cherry crumb recipes that she sent, but nothing like my mom's cherry crumb recipe. Oh, I wish I could taste it. You cook, you said that your mother cooked with love. With love. What does that mean, cooking with love? You, you buy the best and I'm that way myself. I, some things you just cannot buy cheap. You have to buy the best seasonings, the best uh, flavorings, or whatever the, um, the, uh, the ingredients, what you're putting into the recipe, uh, by quality food. Even though I may not have enough money sometimes, I'm gonna buy, I, I want to prepare and give my family and friends the best that I can do. 
So uh, I remember just the other day, someone said, can you bake me three potato pies? And oh, and I know you like this kinds of, these kinds of eggs and this kind of butter, and because it's important. When you're cooking with love, then you, you know, you just, you do your best, and that's the way I am. All right. Your mother uh, passed away mm -hmm. when you were only 18. 19. Oh, 19, mm -hmm. okay. That means that there must have been some influential women that were in your life, were there? At that particular time, I'm gonna tell you, just growing up watching our mother uh, being a great mother family person, our family was very close. So we did a lot of things together. So emulating her um, and people in my community. I've always been around, you know, people even at my church. I grew up in Bethlehem Baptist Church and there were so many other people in our community that, you know, you just want to pattern that after. And even um, now, today, you look at those people like Miss uh, Maxine Mays and I look at my mother-in-law, who I hope she's here today, who's 101 years old and almost 102, December the 3rd. I look at her being strong women, uh, like the Mary Emma Joneses and uh, Dorothy Smith, who was my sixth grade teacher, and other people that, you know, still, like Ms. Alberta Hamilton, who goes to my church. Uh, so you look at those people and you emulate them. Uh, and we are emulating you, Sheila. <laughs> well, yes. We, we're, going to, uh, we're going to honor Dorothy Smith at Southside Elementary School. You'll be hearing more. We're putting um, information out now and we are uh, raising money for that tribute and honor that uh, she will be remembered in bronze at, Sarah, uh, at Southside Elementary School. You learn to sing. Arabia, John Arabia, Arabia Johnson. Johnson, yes. Now let me tell you a little bit about that. Well, what's uh, now Helen Payne Day Nursery, when I attended there, uh, it was Newtown Day Nursery. I didn't know this at the time, that, uh, but they had a Newtown uh, foundation trying to go around to raise money for the Newtown uh, Day Nursery at that time. So Miss Arabia Johnson, who uh, was a teacher and she was a music teacher, matter of fact, uh, I, I took music for maybe a, not even a year. I, I don't know why I stopped, because I love the piano. But my parents bought me an upright piano and I took music uh, from Miss Arabia Johnson. But in, in that interim, uh, Miss Johnson would get, we, all I can remember were girls. And we would come to her house and we would learn songs and, you know, she would talk about, uh, you know, being good girls and, but we would learn to sing songs as well. And so we would go around singing songs to different venues. Now, I didn't know why we were doing it, but that's what we did. And uh, WSPB on City Island, we would go there and tape uh, radio uh, program and we would sing and so this one time I was going to lead a song and it was called Let a Smile Be Your Umbrella and you know being crossed to sing that song and I remember that day I got up there in front of that mic mind you no one in there but us and I said let <laughs> <laughs> so they stopped the taping. <laughs> until Were you I could, crying? Yeah, I was crying. <laughs> I was nervous. Because <laughs> this was my first leading song that I had. So I, I'd really been singing all my life. But I, and then I got myself together and I sang the song. And I'm going to sing a little bit of that song today. You want to hear that? <laughs> And I know Bing Crosby singing, and I, we, you know, but it, I love to sing, whether I'm a 
a, a, a leader, lead singer or not, but I love to sing. Make Mrs. Johnson proud this <clears> morning. <throat> to Miss Arabia Johnson. <laughs> Let a smile be your umbrella on a rainy, rainy day. And if your sweetie cries, just tell her that a smile will always pay. Whenever skies are gray, don't worry or fret. A smile will bring sunshine and you'll never get wet. So let a smile be your umbrella on a rainy, rainy day. A rainy, rainy day. So yes, I've been singing a long time. And I've, I've looked back, I said, wow. I sang at Bethlehem at the youth choir. I sang in, when I was in junior high school in the chorus under Miss Christine Mosby. I remember when the uh, uh, rec center opened, we had to wear our black skirts and white blouses, and we sang at the dedication opening. And, and I also sing at my church. Uh, praise team, choir, and I sing in a community choir, the Gulf Coast Community Choir. Make your plug. Yes, I am right now. <laughs> the Gulf Coast Community Choir is a very diverse choir. If you've never been to one of our concerts, this next year will be our 20th year. It was started by Dr. Carol Buchanan, who's now deceased, and his wife Carol Buchanan uh, passed away last year, who they were great philanthropists in our community. Uh, he started the choir when he came from New York. Uh, so I was in the choir from its conception, and now uh, we give concerts every year to benefit charity. So we have our concerts at St. James Methodist Church on Honoré, and uh, you know, we, at the end of April, I think is our concert, you'll hear it, Gulf Coast Community Choir. And we have a new director, Karen Chester. I'm giving her a plug. Yes. Uh, we, uh, uh, Dr. Edwina Stanley was our director before, who's retired. But the choir is still going. Thank you for that. Thank you. Your parents um, kept you pretty insulated in the community. Um, they dressed you well. <laughs> Your dad somehow bought a car, um, a new one every year and all, but, but, but they seem like such family, family-oriented people, and I want you to talk about this. Although they didn't live very long, they taught you about strong family. Strong family was a must, and still is a must with our family. Um, no, they didn't live long, but family was, it. Uh, we did things, played games together. We watched television together when we were young. I, I was asking my sister, I said, what do you remember? She said, my sister said, remember every Sunday night we were watching the Ed Sullivan show together? <laughs> uh, yes, we did things like that. And we played card games as a family. On uh, Sundays, not every Sunday, but Sundays we would get dressed, like I say, dressed. I remember, I tell you, we had the best looking clothes ever. I think we were the best little dress girls in, in Newtown. Describe one of those dresses. Okay. One of my dresses, and I still can remember the color and everything. I remember my sister's uh, dress as well. We, it's a picture of us together. Was that the picture that's in front of the car? No, not that one. You were dressed one. on really well in that. Yeah, we every time. We, okay. My husband always said, when you all were coming to school, it looks like you were going to church every day. I mean, that's how fine we were dressed. Uh, there was this little dress that was black and gold with gold, like big uh, squares. 
and the, the lines were gold and the dress was black. My sister on the picture had, and we always wore patent leather shoes, my sister had a striped, it was velvet at the top, black velvet at the top, and the bottom had velvet and silver uh, lines going around the dress. That was just one dress. Uh, Latin Lassies was a shop out at, uh, was then Southgate is Westfield now, where my mother bought a lot of our clothes, although she had some a seamstress to make us clothes as well. Uh, but there was this little dress. They had, the dress itself was white. We had little jackets to go over them, which was purple. And on the uh, bodice of the dress, it was some grapes, purple grapes with green leaves. I can remember those dresses. <laughs> And I remember there was another dress in the photo I had. It was blue with polka dots in it. And I always think about uh, that dress. And I had wore red shoe, patent leather shoes oh with that. Oh my gosh. We always had ribbons in our hair and we were dressed. Ooh. We cannot, um, <laughs> we cannot not mention your, your husband, That's your right. husband, my our husband. Our community activist and our former mayor, tell us about how you met Fred Atkins. Well, we met. <laughs> how long have you known him? In first grade. Oh. We were in the same classroom, Mrs. Mac Green's room, and I remember this. Uh, we used to do a lot of plays and skits where the parents would come, and we did a circus. I was the horse tamer, <laughs> and I had on my little tutu, uh, and we would do it. We did it on the Booker High <laughs> Auditorium stage, and but he was a strong man. Mm. Mm -hmm. Still that. <laughs> But he, he would tell you that uh, I didn't give him the time of day then, but he had his eyes on me <laughs> since first grade. Wow. Then when I got my eyes on him, that was another story. <laughs> but yes, Fred Atkins, where are you? Right there. Right here. Oh, hey, baby. <laughs> how, how does he, mm -hmm. how do you, remain optimistic and, and hopeful about the future, given what happened uh, last week that broke residents' hearts, not only in Newtown, but throughout the Sarasota community. The fact that Newtown, many of Newtown, most of Newtown's residents who vote will be disenfranchised for the next two years. How do you remain optimistic and hopeful? How does Fred remain that way? Well, Vicki, we hope, well, first of all, I wanna say thank you to the community mm -hmm. for coming out. Uh, there, we were out in big numbers at the commission meeting that day. Um, you don't give up. Uh, we hope that there will be an injunction lawsuit against the city, uh, the county, mm -hmm. uh, in hopes, you know, that something, something will happen. Happen to change To things. change it. But yeah. uh, other than that, you know, it, it's just like I felt violated, like a slap in the face. And I'm sure my husband, you know, he have to speak for himself, but it hurts me to and feel, I feel for him, and not only him, but the, our community um, that that happened. But he will remain optimistic. Uh, he's, he's a strong man. Uh, and we do, it happened before, so. It know, happened before? Yeah, it happened before when he was running for the county commission that they changed the district at that time as well. So the goal post. The goal post. Is changing. Yes. Okay. Who is Shelia Atkins today? We've, we've run through your history a little bit. Mm -hmm. We didn't say that uh, you were an educator for a long yes. time at the Sarasota School District and retired. For 42 years. 
Yes. Uh, but who am I today? I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a grandmother or great-grandmother, uh, a, a worker in my community, and a, a, a one that loves family. I have to tell this about my family, how my mother and my dad made a difference as far as me being a family person myself. Every second Sunday, we gather at my house or one of my children's house uh, to just be together. I think family is so important that sometimes even when our kids grow, grow up, they leave, we still need to come together in some way. So Second Sundays is one of the uh, things we, I, well, I came up with and involved around food. But before it was Second Sunday with food, uh, when my kids were in the house, uh, we still would have a meeting once a month just to check on the kids, even when they away, were away in college or what have you with their families. We wanted to meet once a month to see how they were doing, what's new in their lives. Because you, sometimes you get away and you don't have that connection. So we want to hold our family together um, as much as we can. We know they don't always, you can't make it every time, but it's there, available. So we gather on second Sundays and we, uh, whoever is in charge of it, pick a cuisine. So we have had some of the greatest times together. And not only family can come, we invite friends as well. So uh, I've attended yeah, one of those Sunday <laughs> afternoon after service dinners, OMG is all I can say. There's food, there's fellowship, there's joy. Yes. It's a beautiful, beautiful it, 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 it's, it makes me feel good inside that we can still do that. Now, does family always get along? No, they don't. But you still have to try. You still have to love unconditionally. So this is one way we can keep up with the grands, the great grands, and our children to see what they're doing, uh, you know, what's in their lives. So Before we open it up, mm -hmm. this discussion to the audience, mm -hmm. what would you uh, tell um, up-and-comers, upstarts, women about being true to themselves and um, embracing uh, family values? First of all, you have to love yourself. You have to have faith. I'm a strong prayer warrior. I believe in prayer. I believe in God. Uh, you know, you have to have that sense of uh, a foundation. So even when we were growing up, in my, in my husband and our family, we would pray together before our kids leave because you don't know when the last time you will see each other. That's why every day, even you now, tell that person that you love them. We need to love more. Mm -hmm. And I get choked up because this is big for me. Every day, you should tell your significant other, your children, if you can. We have a family group text, so that's how we stay connected, too, with these new phones now. So we have a group text. Say good morning. How your day go? Give an affirmation of something. But just tell them that you love them. And being a parent, you just have to you know, be honest. You have to be straightforward. Uh, you have to show love. You just can't tell somebody you love them and don't have the actions to go with it. And so that's important. That's who I have been all my life. And I have to say this because that's who I am. There was this, well, a girl in my class, she said, Sheila, I, named, I, wanted, I told my mother to name my sister Sheila because of you. There was a, a guy, another guy in my class said, you know, nobody else would speak to me, but you would. You would have time for me. So you have to make a difference. Uh, when in your life as well as others' lives, if you love, I love unconditionally. I love everybody. 
my husband say, you can love, you can, <laughs> you, know you can love the devil. <laughs> because, you know, I, hey, but I do love, because I want to see people happy. Yeah. I, want, I want to be happy, and that makes me happy too, saying nice things about people. Because I always say, what goes around comes around. So I want people, I want to be treated how I want to be treated. That's how I'm going to treat others. When you know better, you do better. And so all those things, Vicki, is, you know, it's a part of who I am. You have one more song before we okay. take those questions. Okay. Now this song. Take it away. <laughs> this is another song that we sang with Mrs. Arabia Johnson on the uh, radio station. Did you stop to pray this morning? Did you stop to pray this morning as you started on your way? Did you ask the Lord to guide you Walk beside you through the day. Did you think to pray this morning? Did you kneel just one moment to pray? Oh, the skies will be blue, but he's walking with you. Did you just remember to pray? Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Would anybody have questions for Shelia? Before we retreat to the courtyard, Shelia did something very special, everybody. Remember she talked about her mom's baking? Well, she baked a pound cake. And we're going to share it with you for those who can stay and want to have a piece. And I think there might be some sweet potato pie out there as well. <laughs> it's our way of saying happy Thanksgiving. Any questions that you would have? Yes, sir. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your stories with me today. Hi. I just wanted to know uh, where you source your open heart and, uh, and your love sharing with us today? You know, all my life I can remember it. You know, my mother, we went to church. Um, I have the love of Jesus in my heart. But even when I strayed, I'm just, I'm just that person. I have love in my heart. It's just me. Um, that's who God made me because when you show love, you, that comes back to me. Um, we have to, you know, because the world is so ugly, but my thing is it only takes me, it only takes you to share that one little ounce of love. And when you share that one little ounce of love, it's going gonna, it's gonna to resonate in others. Thank you. I saw one more hand. Good morning, Phil. Good morning, Walter. How are you? I'm just blessed. How are you? <laughs> These are classmates. <laughs> A couple things, uh, if I'm allowed to read two questions. Uh, first, Mm -hmm. our sixth grade teacher. And I would just have you maybe uh, make me respond on what we're trying to do for her in terms of the school board and how everybody can help. Mm -hmm. And I would like to you for you to address address the uh, thing we went through as classmates when we had to integrate public schools there. Okay. Well, when we had to integrate, and I think we were going to the 10th grade at the time, uh, it was trying time. Uh, coming from an all-black school where uh, we had 
everything at our fingertips. Every year we would have parades. Every year you can, uh, you know, we had queens and <laughs> I look at uh, the Miss Booker High and all those kinds of things, a cheerleader. I was a cheerleader at one time. So when integration came, and we had great football players. My husband was a great football player too. And uh, he's my man, that's the cheer I used to do. Oh Fred, Fred, he's my man. If he can't do it, nobody can. <laughs> but anyway, during um, the integration, it, it was a rough time, but it was not only rough for us as African Americans, it was rough for the Caucasians as well. Now I uh, went to Sarasota High and some of us went to Riverview High because they split uh, 27th Street at the time, but MLK now. If you lived on the south side, you went to Sarasota High. If you lived on the north side of 27th Street, you went to Riverview View High. So first of all, they split us up. We had to deal with that. Then, school. Now there were people that still didn't like the idea of blacks coming to an all-white school. But I want to say there were whites that, wel there were whites that welcomed us. Matter of fact, one of my, our classmates is, is uh, Paul Rubens, who is, we know as Pee Wee Herman. Pee Wee Paul, to this day, he still is a friend because he cared. There was a lot of them that cared, but then there were, there were some that did not care. So it was kind of rough, you know, making transition uh, as far as the teachers are concerned, because it has just upset a whole lot. The teachers had to move away from uh, the Booker schools to go into a different setting that was hard for them as well. Because I talked to some that say it was real rough. They, didn't, they sat over there, we sat over here. But I'm gonna tell you, my, like my husband is a leader. Mm -hmm. he, we started a black uh, student union, so we, and voice to voice our opinion. He's been that way all his life to make a difference in our lives. So, um, and then we had some of the teachers that came aboard uh, to help us through this time of our lives. But it was rough uh, at first until, you know, the years went on, but yeah, it was a hard transition. I know what you did, uh, Walter, that was really nice. <laughs> you want me to uh, plug that GoFundMe page? <laughs> I'll do that. We want to honor African-American educators. We're starting with Dorothy Smith because she was the first African-American principal of an integrated, uh, well of a white school and it was South Side. Can I say something on that? Go ahead. Uh, Mrs. Smith was Walter and I's teacher. And at that particular year, they did a, uh, they were trying to do a, uh, well, we had fifth and sixth combination, and then we had a fourth and fifth combination. They was trying to do a trial run of it. I think we were the only class that did that that time. Uh, but Miss Smith, even at that time, she was a trailblazer. She was a great educator that not only introduced uh, her sixth grade class, us, and fifth grade class to different things outside the box. Matter of fact, we came here to the Oslo to see As You Like It in sixth grade. Uh, and she introduced us to other cultures, not only African American cultures, like we would have eating with chopsticks and doing other things. She taught us how to um, crochet and we had a lot of different things that she taught us at sixth grade. And when she became principal at Southside Elementary School, I was there. And I, uh, it was a, a moment, I said, wow, Miss Smith, what an honor. You know, and you were my teacher, so. Were you working there? I think I was working there, that, the year that she, what year, I think so. I see, and you shared, I think you cried. I did. 
Those kinds of things, I'm a crybaby, I'm tell you. I really am. I mean, things that touch me to my heart, I don't mind sh uh, you know, showing my emotions because sometimes we need to show our emotions sometimes um, to let others, even in front of our families, in front of our audience like this, um, yes, I cry. So introducing Dor Dorothy Smith to a new generation of students at Southside is just the first way that we'll use to um, share this African-American history in the district. Um, yeah, we're also working on right now building an African-American art center and history museum so that stories like Shelia has shared today and Mrs. Butler and Sheila Sanders, we can house these stories. We can have visitors and residents alike coming into this uh, museum and history center to learn about this really powerful history of Newtown and Overtown, far from passive people. These people fought for every amenity that we are enjoying today, mm -hmm. including um, an open beach mm -hmm. and open access to public spaces. Mm -hmm. We're so proud of um, the work that they've done. That's why, that's why we're here sitting on this stage telling the stories. Absolutely. It's so important to tell our story. Um, like I keep telling my husband, I say, you need to start writing your book because that man of mine, oh my, he, he is an exceptional, extraordinary man. And I'm not just saying that because he's my husband, but because he is. He, he cares about people. He, you know, he, he has a wealth of knowledge. I remember this man and, and Mr. Walter back there would read encyclopedias just to gain that knowledge. He reads everything. He has a basket of newspaper from all newspapers from all over the world. But, you know, people like that, we have to tell our stories. We have to keep moving on to keep telling our youngsters today because they don't know what we came through. Uh, and even in our communities, the people that have gone before us, we still have to share our stories. Thank you. And with that, mm -hmm. I didn't see a rap, Laura, but I think it's a good place. I think, she, oh, there's one, one other question. I'm sorry. Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm Amanda Carly. Oh, hi, darling. <laughs> That's one of my daughters. Hello, hi. <laughs> hi. Yes, hi. Um, I just want to say you're amazing, Mom. Oh. I love you so much. You did an excellent job up there, and I learned a few things, you know, myself sitting here from you and my grandparents that I never met. Um, it was just amazing. But um, this question I have may not be serious to others, but to me it is. You know, and my sister-in-law here, Francesca. Hey, Franny. Um, we have our second Sunday coming up, and she talked about um, that we do every month or whatnot. It is coming up. I or we just want to know, what cookie are you making? What cookie did you make last year? Oh Lord, the winning cookie. What was the winning cookie? <laughs> it was a pecan ball. But let me tell you, that, that, that's just how, let me tell you something. I have some great cooks. First of all, I have six children, uh, four girls and two boys. I have five grand, grands, no, six grands, four great grands, and another grand on the way. All right. So, but let me tell you, the cookie bake off, every December we have a cookie bake off. And those two back there are the ones started the cookie uh, bake off. Now, my son Baraka and Francesca, they have been winning for the first three years. <laughs> Last year, I'm, I, and I always come in either second place or third place. But last year, I won. <laughs> and this year, now I'm telling you, I have some cooks in my family. And my boys can cook. 
The girls can cook. Everybody can cook. Like, my husband don't want to even take me out to dinner because he said, why are we going out? Your cooking tastes better than what we're going to get out there. So, but I be wanting to go out sometimes, you know. But anyway, I don't know what cookie I'm baking. She's and not I'm not tell telling you. you. <laughs> and see, we, get, we have a plaque, and your picture goes on the plaque with your name, the year you won the cookie contest, so. So you get bragging rights. So we get brag. And every chance we get, I brag. Oh, there's one more question? Oh, okay. <laughs> you are welcome. Uh, She's serious. She's really I'm, I, serious. I am serious, too. Uh, we invite all kinds of people, white people, black people, blue people, green people. You are welcome. Our home is an open, we welcome people in our home. We really do. So if you would like to come to Second Sunday, 1679 35th Street. Woo! Don't be surprised if all this audience shows up at your house. <laughs> Hey, we, 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 always, we always give a shout out to first comers. You might have to move it. Thank you so much. Oh, there's another one. Willie, Willie Clemens, I see you. Quick question. Where in Alabama? Okay. And, well, my mother was born in Arkadelphia, and my dad say he was born in Jemison. Now, lately I've been doing, trying to do some Ancestry.com to see exactly where he was born, because uh, you know I have, I'm doing the research now. But then they moved to my mother and them moved to Colony, Alabama, which near Hansville, Alabama. It's incorporated now, but uh, that's where they were from. Yay! Thank you so much. Steve. This has been wonderful. Thank you for having us. Join us in the courtyard, everybody. We'd love to meet you. Thank you.